Thanks very much. Let's give him a round. All right. Thanks very much. Um, I must say, just to lead in, um, that I sat through the last presentation um, and I can pretty confidently add another thing to the list that lawyers don't understand about software. <laughs> they really wouldn't get asynchronous I.O. <laughs> um, so just in case that doesn't give it away, I am a lawyer. Um, I've got the law degree to prove it and I've nearly got the PhD to prove it as well. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I have a degree in engineering um, and I've, well, I still work as a, as a web programmer, uh, mostly in Python and mostly on the um, wonderful open source product Plone. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was going to make some joke about how at night so I get out my Python and go deeper and deeper into indentation, but I didn't think that was the sort of thing that I should say at a, at a conference which is being recorded. I promised in my abstract that I would reduce my 80,000 word thesis argument to seven words for you and I've had a bit of fun doing that. Um, it's always good to be able to boil down your message to you know, an elevator pitch. But So I've had a few different versions but this is the version that I think um, best describes where I'm up to at the moment. Um, basically I'm saying that um, software and mathematics are, are fundamentally identical and I'll talk about that a little bit in this talk. Um, and as a result, mathematics is unpatentable, always has been unpatentable. Um, another interesting side issue is no one knows why, or at least in the most recent case I could find, no lawyer could find any authority for the proposition that mathematics is unpatentable, right, in a case in the UK. Um, but the reason that I believe that, that mathematics is unpatentable is that for mathematics to advance, it depends on, on freedom. It depends on free access to the existing state of knowledge of mathematics. Um, and I guess I should say, if, if there are any questions at any point throughout, feel free to, to um, interrupt because the longest talk I've given in the last 12 months is about 15 minutes and the shortest is about 90 seconds, so um, it may be that I run under time a little bit. Okay, so now that I've told you where I'm coming from, um, we can start with, with my proposition that lawyers don't understand software. Um, now obviously, I, as I said, I'm a lawyer, so this isn't intended to be a lawyer bashing exercise, um, although you know, there may be an appropriate forum for that. You could have a boff for that if you wanted, perhaps. Um, but don't expect me to be there. <laughs> um, basically, I've gone through various stages with this, with this PhD, and the first stage was anger. Why the hell do they continue to get this wrong? I can't believe it. It's so simple. Why do courts and legal academics continue to get the issue wrong? Uh, but I've moved on past that and I've, I've come to the realisation that really they're trying to do the best that they can with what they understand. Um, but like being a patent court judge is a pretty difficult project, you know. Um, you go from biomedical engineering case one week to a software case the next and so on and so on. So they have to kind of get their heads around very technical areas in a very technical area of law. Um, and it's, it's almost inevitable that they're going to make mistakes. So after four years of reading all the various cases, um, I've come up with seven things that I think that they could improve on. So it's a bit of a report card for lawyers. But one thing you might need to keep in mind is that your mileage will vary depending on who the lawyer is you're talking about. Some lawyers get it, some lawyers don't. You know, so if you're talking about Eben Moglen, obviously he gets it a lot better than Perry Mason. Not only because Perry Mason's, Mason's a fictional entity. Okay, so we'll start through the top seven. A couple of differences between Dave Letterman and I. Um, <laughs> I can think of a few more differences between Dave Letterman and I, but they're not in any particular order. The order's arbitrary, but I think as, as they kind of go on, you, you get a sense of all the, th all the things that I've looked at in my thesis. Okay, so the first one. The relationship between software and mathematics. Well, as I said at the start, I think software really is mathematics. Um, that they're fairly much, the software is a mathematical, writing software is a mathematical task. Uh, there's a few reasons why I've come to that conclusion. Firstly, formally, um, anything that can be computed so far with possible exceptions like quantum computing um, falls within the domain of that which can be computed by a Turing machine. 
Um, but anything that can be computed by a Turing machine can also be calculated with the lambda, lambda calculus, right? So on a formal level, um, software and mathematics cover the same range of, of computational realms. Secondly, historically, software and mathematics have a very, very strong link. Um, in fact, Alan Turing got the idea for the Turing machine out of the formalist mathematics program by David Hilbert and um, also from Principia Mathematic, the logicist school who sought to reduce proof of mathematical truths to small discrete steps. Right, so you know what your starting point is, you have a series of steps, none of which can be argued with to arrive at your conclusion. Um, which also gives rise to a kind of structural similarity between mathematics and software, um, namely that. And that's known as the Curry-Howard isomorphism. Basically, the tasks involved in doing mathematics and doing mathematical proofs are very similar to the tasks involved in coding. And I also think that it, it, intuitively they're, they're similar as well. Um, anyone want to...? <laughs> no? No challenge? <laughs> Good. Okay. So as I said before, mathematics is not patentable and, and never has been. There's cases where they kind of mention um, off, offhand, or obiter as we say in the law, um, that mathematics isn't patentable. But there hasn't been any real investigation of why. Um, but nonetheless, it's not patentable. So you would expect, with mathematics and software being the same, that software would also be not patentable. Now, just to give an illustration of how that... Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason, well, the only, yes, that would be, it would be possible to make mathematics patentable, but since it's always been not patentable, um, you'd have to have a pretty good reason for, for changing the existing law, right? Um, this is one case which kind of illustrates that, that lawyers don't really get the distinction between software and mathematics. And this, in this case, this was the first of two software patent cases in Australia. Um, and in that case, uh, IBM had come up with a, with a more efficient way of drawing a curve on a screen. Right? So you start with a set of control points. Um, they applied two well-known mathematical algorithms to those control points to come up with a matrix representing the pixels on the screen. Right? So you start with numbers, you do something mathematical to them, and you end up with a matrix full of numbers. Mathematics? Well... No. What his honour said was, what is new here is the application of the selected mathematical methods to computers, and in particular the production of the desired curve by computer. This is said to involve steps which are foreign to the normal use of computers, and for that reason to be inventive. Right? So, kind of what he's saying is that applying mathematics to something mathematical isn't necessarily mathematics and unpatentable because it's applied mathematics. Now that might ring true in other discipline, disciplines like physics which use mathematics, right? But the use of mathematics doesn't prevent patenting. So it's a kind of curious argument that, that turns on itself. And that's just one example of many. There's lots of examples in the US case law. But that's my favourite because it's just so crazy. And so you have something irreconcilable that that which is patentable is also not patentable. Okay, the, the second thing which, um, which lawyers don't really seem to get is the relationship between software on the one hand and mental steps, or call it what you like, call it logic, call it reason. Um, just as mathematics has always been unpatentable, ideas have always been held to be not patentable. Um, and in the recent case in the US of Inri Bilski, um, the court pointed out that that was because of the constitutional protection of freedom of thought. Um, you know, it, patents were never supposed to extend to regulating what people think. So, it would also seem that, um, that well, you would think that, you know, the process of, of mechanised reasoning, which is what writing software is, you know, you're breaking down an algorithm into a series of small discrete steps um, would fall a foul or run a foul or at least raise concerns that um, maybe we'd, we need to tread carefully here. And 
if you needed any proof of that, you only have to think about what Turing actually meant when he defined his Turing machine. He didn't have in mind some form of computer like the Colossus that he was working on at Bletchley Park. What he had in mind was a person sitting down with a pen and paper following the rules set out for the system exactly. Right? Um, and it was only later that that came to be realised as, as a computer. You can, you can see that kind of that, that reasoning, that mental process in action if you look at, at, um, at mathematics as well. And this is something from Principia Mathematica. I think this is about 500 pages in where they are able to finally formally prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Right. The reason that it took them so long was that they wanted to be able to defend their starting points and they wanted to be able to defend every single tiny little step that they took in expanding from their starting points to each proposition. Right. And they claimed to have been able to prove the truth of the whole of mathematics through pure logic and these small discrete steps until Kurt Gödel got in the way. Okay. So the next thing which, which at least raises concerns is related to the last point and it's the role of abs abstraction in software development. Um, now courts certainly recognise that there's a need to have some kind of physical limit on patentable subject matter and the reason that there is that physical limitation, like it has to involve some physical device or something, is that um, the physicality of an invention is a source of uncertainty. right? And overcoming that uncertainty is the sort of thing which needs to be protected against by a patent. Like a patent gives you protection to try and commercialise an invention and gives the inventor the time to overcome the various uncertainties that might be involved in actually taking a prototype and getting it to market. Right? Um, and when you deal with physical devices, you've got all sorts of things like, um, you know, like, like heat dissipation in computing is one obvious example. You know, if you're designing processes, then that's something physical that you need to worry about. Um, in the US, the, the test that they set out in Bilski is that um, your invention needs to be tied in some way to a particular machine to be patentable, or it needs to transform some physical thing. Now that, that is actually a very, very old thing. That, that test dates back to about 1876 in the US, but it had fallen out of favour, so Bilski's basically revived it. In Australia, we have a similar-ish test um, in that there's required to be some physical effect as a result of your patentable process um, in the sense of a concrete effect or phenomenon or manifestation or transformation. Now that's all well and good and that should be the end of the story, right? Because soft, that, that should be the end of the story because there's a physical device involved, right? But as I mentioned before, the history of software suggests that abstractions come into play, right? When computers were first invented, it was all, you know, everything was done, had to be done in machine code. There's a very direct relationship with the hardware that you're running on, different um, processes, different instruction sets and so on. And then the first abstraction was to abs abstract away to assembly language. Um, and then further abstractions away to higher level languages, right? Um, and to give a kind of example, the sort of things I do, I developed an online test product for Plone. You know, multiple choice quizzes, nothing too fancy. But if you look at the, the levels of abstraction between the code that I wrote and the hardware, um, there's a hell of, hell of a lot of abstraction there. And I don't think at any point I actually had to consider um, anything tied to the physicality of, of the machine that it was going to run on. I didn't have to worry about the architecture. Uh, Python's pretty much the same. Um, no matter what sort of machine you've run it, run it on, no matter what sort of operating system you run it on. So there's no physical limitation on the software that I wrote. Now that might be entirely different in a different context. For example, if, if you're writing a device driver, you're very much concerned with the hardware. Um, if you're working on the kernel, the, the hard, hardware that it's supposed to run on is a big concern, right? But that's an issue of context, right? So context is very Im important, but context doesn't seem to be something which has been taken into account very much. Um, and the abstraction problems made even worse by the kind of top-down development process as well, where you know you start with a concept and you work towards the code. So if you kind of stack up the layers of abstraction on each other, um, you can see that. 
because patent claims are generally written not as source code, you're talking about things which are written in natural language at very general um, levels, then patents kind of, patent claims kind of sit on the top of this, this pile of abstraction. So courts should be really careful to consider whether the physicality of the device actually does limit the invention in some way. Or whether you've got something which is um, basically amounts to a patent on an idea. And I mentioned the context as well. So what's interesting to consider, um, and this is a particular concern that I have with, with the case law in Bilski, you know, but Bilski might be caused to celebrate um, the fact that they've finally got software patent issues right. But in the past, um, the physicality of software has been held to be satisfied by the electrons which move around the computer when you, when you run the software. Okay, that's, <laughs> I can't say I've ever had to worry about the path of an electron when I've been writing web-based <laughs> content management system software. Um, satisfied by the floppy disk, uh, that you put the software on went before you load it into the computer. And in the Australian um, case, satisfied in a, in a smart card related invention, which was basically a patent on a particular way of um, structuring data, it was held to have been satisfied by attaching a printer to the terminal which read the smart card. Right? In the Australian um, context, that satisfied the, the physical effect test. Right? So although we have a physical effect test, in, um, it's not consistent with what they're talking about in Bilski. Any questions on that? Okay, the next one is, is reuse. Um, as I mentioned in the history of software, uh, you know, you, you necessarily depend on the work that, that's gone before you. If you had a look at the stack of abstractions, you know, when I'm writing a, a component for Plone, I depend on, you know, the Plone and Python and everything basically down the stack to be able to do the work. Um, US patent 5960411, anyone want to hazard a guess what that is? I thought I heard it there. No, it's not that. One click, One click. yeah. <laughs> um, now, had Jeff Bezos and his team written themselves, you know, their website in machine code from nothing all the way to the point of implementing this one-click um, patent, well, then that would have been great. But I suspect that this number has more to do with the number of people that Jeff Bezos owes some gratitude for to actually getting him to the point where he could implement cookies in the way that he did to get the patent. And that's, you know, the importance of reuse and the idea of incremental invention is a, is a fairly well-worn path, so I don't really have a lot more to say about it. Um, the next point is the beauty of code. Um, I've used, used the term beauty to invoke, um, to kind of tie in with mathematics, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of how beauty is considered to be important to mathematics. Um, for example, Bertrand Russell um, said that mathematics rightly viewed possesses not only truth but supreme beauty, a beauty cold and austere like that of sculpture, without appeal to any part of our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music, yet sublimely pure and capable of a stern perfection such as only the greatest art can show. Um, and Poincaré similarly said that a mathematician does not study pure mathematics because it's useful, he studies it because he delights in it and he delights in it because it's beautiful. So under, understanding mathematics and, and getting to the truth of it, it um, is a source of beauty. And beauty is an incentive mechanism which operates in the context of mathematics. And it's one of the reasons that mathematics is considered a fine art rather than a useful art to use the traditional distinction that they make in patent law. Right? Patents are supposed to be available for things that are useful and things that are beautiful or, th or fine arts are supposed to be the realm of copyright. Um, so, can software be beautiful? Well, I'll give my favourite example. I always like to... <laughs> this one has everything as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, 
not only does it have a visual aesthetic, um, is there anyone here who hasn't seen this before? Yep, a couple. All right, well, this is what you get when you run it. <laughs> um, it's not really only about the way it looks visually. It's just that it's so insanely cool that every time I look at it, I just think, how could you possibly do that? <laughs> you know, how, where do you start? And it, there's, a, there's a technical excellence there um, in being able to come up with that that I, I just find astounding. So I have an emotional reaction to it in the same way that I might if I looked at a particularly fine piece of art over there <laughs> on the wall. Um, but the, th the problem that comes up for lawyers right, is they're distracted by the usefulness of software. So undoubtedly most people's um, experience of software is not writing it or reading it, it's running it. Right? And if you run it, well then you generally need to run it for a purpose and it's probably going to be useful to you. They think of software as something that you buy in a box down the shops, you know, or maybe they're starting to change their minds. But um, so they're distracted by the usefulness of it, and they think, well, okay, it, it, it fits with a patent regime. It doesn't really fit with a copyright regime. Um, but the fact about software is not that it is really just beautiful. It is useful, and I wouldn't deny that it was useful. But really, the expressive nature of software has a lot more to do with. Um, the way it should be treated than is currently considered. Um, and the best example that I could think of, of something which is considered to be a fine art which is also useful, the only other example I could think of is architecture. Right? There's no doubt that buildings are useful. You know, we live in them, we, we use them. But architecture is protected by copyright. Individual things which go in houses might be considered to be patentable, but a house isn't something which, which you would get a patent on. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've really the point here is that expression, um, or another, another related point is that to people who haven't read code, they'd probably be surprised to find the number of, of comments that, you know, in, in code, that, that source code is for other people as well as. Um, as well as the, for the machines that it runs on. And I was poking around have, trying to find some funny comments uh, in code the other day, but most of them seem to have, you know, obscene language in them, so <laughs> I thought I'd better not. On a related note, um, there's a distinction which, which courts try to make between code and data, which I don't think works really well. And again, back to this example, um, the code is the data as well. You know, like, um, it's hard to make that clean distinction all the time between code and data, particularly looking at code as something for machines versus something that other people read. Right? So quite often people you know, read source code to work out how something works, and you learn what good software is by reading good source code you know, and, and seeing what hacky, terrible code is by writing it yourself. <laughs> Um, and I just, I just wonder. I mean, I'd, I'd be open to see whether you, whether you would agree with me that writing better code is something which you already have an incentive to do because you want to be able to achieve that kind of technical excellence that I was talking about. Do you think expression's an incentive for you guys when you sit down and write code? Yeah. Okay. Well, the final one I want to talk about is a, it's kind of a more, a more subtle problem that lawyers have. Um, and I'll read you the quote. I remember reading this quote in the first couple of weeks of my candidature, candidature for a PhD and thinking there was something wrong but not being 100% able to put my finger on, on what it was. So in this article I read um, by an Australian academic, certainly software developers are adamant that they have property rights in their software, just ask one. Right? Um, <laughs> she obviously didn't ask this one. 
<laughs> well, he certainly is, yes, yeah, certainly he's adamant. Maybe she should have left it at that. <laughs> um, but what I would really like to know, if, I'll tell you essentially what I think the essence of property is. The essence of property is the right to exclude. So I have a question and a show of hands. Do you believe, hands up for yes, do you believe that you have the right to exclude others from the code that you write just by virtue of having written it? Should have. Do you believe you should have? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, well, that's that's one of the interesting things. Um, about it. I've taken the Creative Commons logos because they, they kind of break down the various things that might be in, involved in, in your, you know, you might, you might, there's a kind of property way of thinking about things, you know. Um, could you be just as satisfied if anyone who used your code had to pay for it, right? Yeah, if you released it. That, that's something that doesn't necessarily involve a right to exclude. Um, and for example, there's a there's a an academic called Jerome Reichman, who suggests that the the best way to protect software is to have a kind of um, a government agency with which whom you can deposit code. Anyone can download and read it, but if they then use it, they have to pay a royalty. Right. So that's just an example of something that's not property based. Would that be something which you'd find acceptable, or is, or is that not? Would that fall? Yeah. I mean, that's the ultimate exclusion. It's saying, hey, it's mine. Nobody else gets to do it. Yeah, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Have you ever read a, a patent application? Yeah. Did you find it instructive? <laughs> I once read the patent for .NET. I don't know what possessed me. I still don't know what .NET is. I mean, I didn't know what .NET was, and I was I was using VB.NET at the time. Cringe. <laughs> but you know, they're not they're not instructive. They're not something that you think. Oh, I need to find a new way to do this. I'll, I'll just go to the just go to the patent library and have a look through the applications. You know, I'll go to the USPTO website and use that. You know, the and the main reason I think is you know. Back to a point I said earlier about the source code. The source code is the best documentation that you can get for an invention. Um, if people don't want want to release their code, right? You don't you don't need a property right to exclude others. Um, possessing it is enough, right? If you if you write it and you keep it on your computer and you don't give it to anyone, that, that's generally speaking enough. Um, I, I suspect. Now I've just I've just got one final quote that I. I I couldn't do a talk on things lawyers don't understand about software without throwing this quote in. It was in a curiously pro-software patent article by a couple of academics that I'd never heard of in a law journal. The authors are grateful to Microsoft for supporting the research on which, on which this paper is based. It wasn't until I got to the end notes and, and had a flick through that I kind of light went on and thought, <laughs> what's this about? Um, that's really all I wanted to get through, but you know, I know, I know software patents are a hot issue, so I'm sure that you've all got things that you want to ask or things that you want to say. So there's plenty of time left. Take the floor, go for it. Any questions? Not seeing any responses. Hey? Uh, yeah. Okay. The question was: Has anyone received a DMCA notice for um, a patent when they've been working on for a project they've been working on? No. Okay. Yeah. Does the interaction of 
Um, Yeah, no, the overlap of different copyright, rate, copyright uh, different intellectual property regimes is a really interesting area because often they do overlap like that. Um, but that's another, it's another interesting thing that it's not really considered, you know. I, I think um, they don't really, judges don't really consider what the impact of, say, having the copyright means when they're considering whether software should be patentable as well. I mean, software was clearly copyrighted to begin with and that was less objectionable. Yeah. Well, there's been a flow-on effect, I think, from software becoming patentable. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the storyline patents. That, that went through, right? Uh, a budding and enterprising young patent attorney on seeing that software and then business methods had become patentable decided that maybe there should be um, protection for other things which are copyrighted. So he tried to get protection on, the, on a plot for a movie uh, and, and it was successfully granted. I believe it was revoked um, not too long ago or I believe that the Bilski test will wipe it out. But I think that when you take something which has previously been copyrighted and then you say, yes, it can also be patented. Well, then that, that does disrupt the balance in the copyright regime uh, as well as the patent regime. Right? And, but that's not something which is, the, the interaction of, the, of them hasn't been considered very well as well. There's an int interesting kind of similarity when copyright overlaps with trademark. Right? So you get copyright protection, say, for, I don't know, Mickey Mouse for you know, more and more and more and more time. When the copyright runs out, you can expect Disney to then say, well, people identify Mickey Mouse with us. So if they see Mickey Mouse in something, they're going to think that's got something to do with us. That's the role that a, a trademark has. So now we've got a common law trademark as well. Right? So there, there's all sorts of interactions between the, the different regimes, but generally they tend to treat them all as silos that don't have any interaction. And that's why sof software is so difficult. It's expressive. <coughs> As I said, it, it fits. Source code is a literary work of some kind. It's definitely written in a language. It has, and languages have all the expressive attributes that, that um, Engli the English language does. Um, but it is useful. So it, it has that kind of seeming fit with, um, with the patent regime as well. And so really I think the only, or the best way to protect it um, would probably be for some sort of sui generis regime. Um, because if, if you leave software to just copyright alone, there's always going to be that kind of pressure on it to say, well, it, it doesn't protect against um, independent imitation. You know, it doesn't protect against functional equivalence. Um, so people are going to be crying that you know, copyright doesn't do everything that it needs to do to protect software. So I think the only real solution will be when it's removed from copyright and patent and um, put in a, in a unique regime. Right, which fits things that don't fit in the traditional categories. But where that would leave open source licensing, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's, that's a difficult question in itself because you know, open source depends on, on copyright at the present time. Um, but you know, maybe that's something that, that could be taken into account in asking for this kind of change. Well, you know, if we're disclosing the source code, we're disclosing the product anyway. Um, maybe we waive the right to royalties so long as you know, there's, there's still room for licensing in a, in a different regime, but it's part of the balance that needs to be considered. Sorry, yeah, with the glasses. Are there things that you would suggest that we can do to help the situation? Well, one of the motivations for this talk was, was really um, that I, I think these are things that lawyers don't understand. So part of the solution, I think, is to help, help the legal fraternity understand the things that they're getting wrong, you know? I think maybe if they could understand that software is different because it's so abstract and there really is a con cause for concern that, you know, possibly patenting, patenting ideas um, and bringing the experience to bear in, in kind of helping the legal fraternity get it right rather than warring with them or assuming that, that they're just idiots or that lobbying through parliaments is the only way to go. Um, so it's kind of a, a pragmatic thing based on, well, they, they have a lack of understanding to see if we can improve things through education. Yeah. One of the things that I've always found most ridiculous about patents is that you can unknowingly infringe. Um, is there any reason why, why, why that 
Um, unknowing infringement, yeah. Well, basically that's the reason why unknowingly infringing a patent still gives rise to liability is that you're awarding a monopoly to the to the patent holder, and so intention isn't isn't really relevant. It's relevant in the U.S. for damages purposes, but if you're truly going to protect someone's invention, then you have to protect them against anyone who comes up with something similar. Yeah, you, if you're giving them a monopoly, you can't say you've got a monopoly unless someone independently comes up with the same thing, because that sort of encourages gaming of the system. You know, there would be ways to gently push, you know, a developers in you know, a slightly different company or you know in in a slightly different location clean room sort of thing um there'd be a way to push them to come up with a similar invention without actually them having any knowledge that, that, that that's what they were doing yeah how many cases do you know um well i read everything that i could get my hands on and say from from the State Street case, following the footnotes and all the references, all the way back to the 1800s, um, all the important ones. You know, there's there's a lot. Um, hundreds, hundreds, definitely, definitely hundreds that make it to court. In Australia, a lot less, I think. Um, you know, there's only been two decided software patent cases, and none of them were by the highest court anyway. Well, in the IBM case, they said that, um, well, if it, if, if it produces a useful effect, then it's patentable. Right? Um, and then that was confirmed in the, in the subsequent case. Yeah. Well, if you put yourself in the position of, of someone who's threatened with patent litigation, the costs are enormous, you know. So it's a very good bluff. If you've got a validly issued patent, there's a lot to be said for it, whether it's got any value or not. You know, you've either got to step up and challenge the patent, in which case, if you're unsuccessful, you've got to pay the costs of the other party. And the other party, if, if they've gone out and they're able to afford to buy a patent in the first place, they've probably got the money to put on a, a good legal team. You know? So you can, it could cost you a million dollars if you lose. And there's not a lot of people who would have a million dollars or would be so prepared to actually stand up and fight a patent like that. Yeah. Yep. So all the things you've talked about today seem to be mostly related to patents. Yeah. Um well I kinda touched on the effect of effect of you know, um, of not understanding software and copyright in that, you know, it doesn't quite protect the, the use. It doesn't protect against in, um, independent imitation. Um, but patent law is, is, is certainly my bias, but I, I think it's the, the most interesting area. I, I've read cases on, on copyright of software, and it almost seems to me that courts considering copyright seem to do a better job of engaging with the issues, like the, the top-down development model and, and the, is something that was discussed in Computer Associates and Altai. Um, and they seem to be switched on, but I'm not quite sure why there isn't that same engagement in patent law, and I suspect, um, I suspect that it's just not litigated as much or that there's something about the way the patent law is structured that doesn't require them to engage with the kind of wider um, non-economic or non-legal issues T tend to take a very narrow focus um, on, a, on, a, on a set of legal issues, legal interpretations and the previous case law and a bit of economics, but they don't really consider what the social impact of awarding a patent is, or they don't consider the ethics of a patent in a particular area to any real extent. Um, and I don't know if that's just the tradition of patent law to say, well, you know, if, if you've got ethical and social issues, well, then they can be resolved by legislation elsewhere. Okay. Sorry, I've missed your question a few times. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, you were talking, I know you were talking about the difference between expressive and functionality, and that that was always really the difference between, it seemed to me, to me, to be the difference between the source code and the actual running program. Yeah. Under 
write as a functional theme. Yep. Or there's patented source code, but make people have to choose one or the other. Because yeah. Because as you were saying, different people want different protections. It, it would be possible. I, I don't think that it necessarily remove the source of the problem. I mean, you've got to look at who's doing most of the software patenting, and most of it's big firms doing it for defensive purposes or small um, troll companies, you know, to make money. And they're still going to continue to go for the patents, and they don't really care about the copyright so much. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, up, up the back here. Yeah. Yeah. By, by licensing or by preventing other people to do it. It's yep. The preventing is me, it's not the original. Um, it's not the original. Yeah, yeah, it, it, has that, it has that social purpose. With software at the moment, the rate of development and improvement is so fast that the time to market is actually key. If you distract yourself with patenting, um, you actually. Yeah. So your time to market is really fast. And also, <coughs> there's also improved mouse traps. The original patent system doesn't deny you from building that mouse trap, it's just that particular mouse trap design that was patented. With software, same thing. It shouldn't actually um, remove the opportunity to improve the technology in the second part of software. It just moves much faster. So just having a copyright allows you to get to market and allows you to get in. If you have source code that is GPL, for instance, Yeah. Um, which is kind of an attempt to, to mitigate that. I still think it's more of the double patent thing on software. It just doesn't work in the software sphere. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is another point. Well, well, that's exactly right. I mean, you said at the outset that the purpose of having a patent is to guarantee a return. Yeah. Well, there's other ways to guarantee returns that don't even have to involve property rights. That's the kind of point that I was trying to get. If you if you start with that as your goal to guarantee a return, um, then yeah, something which which gives you maybe a, a small standardised royalty for people who use your software further down the track and, and maybe even people who improve on your original invention should have to pay you some form of royalty. Well, then that's probably more encouragement because there's not all the administrative crap involved <laughs> that there is in getting a patent and the expense and the timelines and that sort of thing. Yeah? Yeah, it's a it's a well it's it's a well worn path of rhetoric really. Um, if you have a look at who's actually doing the patenting, um, there was a study by I think it's Besson and Hunt in the U.S. They had a look at the data of um, what firms were patenting and whether firms who were patenting a lot were spending more on R and D and those sorts of things. And basically, they found it's mostly big firms. They're mostly doing it for defensive purposes. And there's a correlation between um, the number of patents increasing and a drop-off in R&D spending. Right? So basically their conclusion was you know, that um, 
that there's not that incentive in the software industry for patents at all, which I'm sure doesn't surprise anyone here. Yeah, that's, that's the Cold War scenario where big companies buy lots of patents, not really to enforce them, but as a backup plan. So if I come to you and say, well, you're infringing on one of my patents, I can say, well, you're probably infringing on one of my 100,000. Um, let's do a licensing deal. It doesn't cost them anything. And, yeah, so it's a form of insurance, mostly, and that's the way that, that software patents are mostly being used. Yeah, well, that's it. Trolls don't have any assets. They don't... They don't care if they lose, they just want the licensing fee. So that strategy doesn't work against them at all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Source code can't be patented, what you do is you get a patent attorney to draft a description of your invention in um, patent speak, which is as broad as you can possibly get, and so not very instructive usually. Um, and sorry, what was the first part of it? You might want to mention defensive publications. Yeah, uh, defensive publications. If you, are you familiar with the SCO litigation? I'd imagine that most people are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, one of the best things that I saw in the entire SCO debacle was um, when Dale McBride um, finally put up and said, look, here's some infringing code in the kernel. Um, and this, you know, within a day, people were actually able to find it and go through the version control for that particular set of code and say, well, actually, it was contributed by X here and it was blah, 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 and could basically defeat the code. So. On that basis, you know, if, if you publish your code um, before the date of application of a patent, you know, well then that, that becomes prior art and that becomes a weapon for defeating a, a badly issued patent. So open source is also good for that purpose. And, but further, if you just, you know, if you're writing code and you, you just want to publish it, you don't necessarily need to open source license it. You could do a defensive publication and just get your code out there. Um, up to you. Depends on your business model, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the question is, do do lawyers get mathematics? Yeah. So can you can you hinge your arguments on the unpatentability of mathematics? Well. Yeah. <laughs> like I said before, there was a case in 2007 um, about the patentability of a, of a mathematical um, innovation, and counsel on neither side, you know, in, in the UK could find any precedent, you know, any any case where the idea that mathematics wasn't patentable first came into being. So there is a danger there. There is a danger that they don't get mathematics and that the reverse of what I'm saying will happen is that because software's become patentable and because courts now talk about mathematical algorithms as being the same as software in a sense, that they won't understand any reasons for keeping mathematics free anymore. So one of the things that I've done in my thesis is to actually have a look at the philosophy of mathematics and try and answer the question of what mathematics is and see if there's anything about um, mathematics, any explanation that makes it clear why it is that mathematics shouldn't be patentable. And what I've come up with was um, the expressive nature of it and the importance of beauty and, and the importance of achieving truth um, makes, it, makes it expressive and makes it something which isn't really suited to patent protection. But it is a danger. It's a definite danger. Yep. 
<laughs> That's a very good question. I remember when I started, I did my first computer science programming course at uni, um, the, the tutor said in an offhand manner, you need to choose between Vi and Emacs. Um, and somehow I ended up using Vi and I've regretted it ever since. But <laughs> only because I just, I just get lost, you know, I, I forget to type the colon before I type Q and then it goes into some recording mode and I can't remember how to get out of it and stuff like that. But I can't remember the, I can't remember the key bindings for Emacs. So I have actually started using Aquamax Emacs, which has a lot of the, the standard Apple key bindings. So I started to wet my feet a bit, but I'm still a Vi user. I'm sorry to the Vi users out there. I'm sure that it has advantages that I just plainly don't understand. <laughs> One more, one more question? Yeah. Um, there's been some talk every now and then, not like every now and then, about the whole first of file versus first of the thing. Um, would you be able to summarise that? Because I've, I've, I've tried reading about that and I've been confused about the pros and cons of file, but it seems that the US has one system and everyone else has another. Yeah, I, I, I think it's probably for historical reasons. Um, it's, it is, is strange, but in the US they've always had a, a first to file, so it doesn't matter who actually came up with the invention first, the first person to get their patent application in to the patent office in the US will be the one who deserves patent protection. So if you say you came up with the idea three days before but you got your patent in um, three days later, then the other party will then, you know, they filed first, they'll get the invention. I can't say that I really understand the policy reason for it, particularly when you look at the way they judge whether a patent is, is novel or not. Um, and if you're going to say, well, the prior art on that date was this, I guess it has to be a published document. No. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't really make sense to me. First to invent makes more sense because then you can kind of say, well, we came up with it on this date. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it, it still leaves them out of, out of step with the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So there are policy reasons which other people could give you, but I couldn't. No, I tend to stick mostly to patentable subject matter, which, you know, you can, it's amazing that you can spend four or five um, years on just one aspect of patent law, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much.